This week on Q&A, Amy Greenberg, professor of American history at Penn State University, on her book, Lady First, The World of First Lady Sarah Polk. Amy Greenberg, why did you name your book Lady First? Well, um, it wasn't the title that the press wanted, but when I thought about First Lady Sarah Polk and how she deployed power, I thought about the fact that in her own mind, she was always a lady before anything else. She thought of herself as Mrs. James K. Polk. Um, She was very invested in people deferring to her, but also she was willing to defer to men. And she really considered herself a lady, so I thought Lady First was a good title. Of course, she was also a first lady. What would you say about their relationship? Well, um, James and Sarah Polk had about as close and positive of a relationship as any married couple could have. They were rarely separated. The reason that Sarah came to Washington in the first place when James was a new congressman and she was just 22 years old was because they couldn't stand to be apart. They were newly married. And the whole time that they were together, they depended on each other far more than anybody else. She was James's closest confidant. He didn't have a lot of male friends. Um, But he and Sarah were basically inseparable. Why didn't he have a lot of male friends? Well, depending on who you talk to, there are different answers to that question. From my reading of his character and all his letters and studying his career over the past decade, I think that he was an introvert. He was, um, I think, nervous, a nervous person. He wasn't a voluble, fun guy. He had almost no sense of humor. So people didn't really take to him, and he had a hard time forging close connections with other people, with the exception of members of his own family and Sarah. There's also the point that he lied as well to various politicians, so he had a sort of reputation of being untrustworthy. Did the public know he was lying at the time? I don't think they did. I mean, this is a major question that historians have debated, particularly as pertains the uh, declaration that he made about the United States going to war with Mexico. So rather than going to Congress uh, to ask for a declaration of war, he went to Congress and he said, a war is in process. It's in progress. Just give me some money to fight this war. And the statement that he made to Congress was that American blood had been shed on American soil. And despite all of the United States' efforts to avoid war with Mexico, there was, it was Mexico had done it. It was Mexico's war. And so... um, He basically said the United States is not responsible for this war. Mexico's the enemy. And that, I think, everybody knew was a lie. Now, it's possible there's a lot of people that were uninformed in the public who didn't know, but everyone in Congress knew that it was a lie. You went to the University of California, Berkeley? I did, yes. Go Bears. You got a PhD from Harvard. When did you first get interested in the U.S.-Mexican War? That's a great question. When I was in grad school, my dissertation advisor was a great historian named Bill Gnapp. And his advisor, when he had first gone to grad school at Berkeley, was Charles Sellers. Well, at least that who he's intending to work with. And Charles Sellers uh, wrote two volumes of what was supposed to be a trilogy on Polk's life. He never wrote the third volume. And one um, afternoon, as uh, historian grad students tend to do, I pulled these volumes down from the great stacks of Widener Library, and I started reading them as opposed to what I was supposed to be reading, which is my schoolwork. And I found the way that Sellers wrote about Polk and the way that he brought the antebellum America to life to be utterly compelling. And that was when I got interested in Polk. And I grew up in Southern California. Interestingly, when I was growing up, um, very little was ever said about the U.S.-Mexico War. I'm pretty confident that our curriculum in school skipped directly from the mission period when Spain owned California to the Bear Flag Revolt when Americans rose up against uh, Mexican, Spanish, who knows, uh, rule and 
declared California free. So I don't ever remember learning about the U.S.-Mexico War, but certainly by the time I was in college, uh, I realized, wow, California was taken from Mexico. We have, uh, back in 2012, an address you made at the Abraham Lincoln Library out in Springfield, Illinois, about a wicked war. Yes. That's another one of your books. And when did you write that? And what what's the main message in that book? All right. So the way that I got interested in Sarah Polk was in the process of writing that book. And in fact, when I look back um, at my career of writing books, every book sort of grows out of the previous book. So with the U.S.-Mexico War book, um, A Wicked War, Polk, Clay, Lincoln, and the 1846 U.S. Invasion of Mexico, what I really wanted to do was tell the story of the U.S.-Mexico War in a way that um, was focused on individuals and how they were affected by the war. Because I felt like, as a scholar and as a teacher, there were no books about the U.S.-Mexico War that really made sense to students. Um, there's a lot of battles in a lot of different places, and the U.S. wins all of them, and then the U.S. takes all this land. And um, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a hard story to narrate unless you just want to narrate it as the U.S. was um, incredibly advanced in terms of technology and had an amazing fighting force and defeated Mexico, end of story. But I knew for a fact that a lot of people had died in the war, um, that the war impacted a ton of people. So I thought, what if I wrote this story in the way that somebody might narrate a war like um, World War II, which my father fought in, or the Civil War, so that people really got a sense of it was a war where people suffered um, and people sacrificed, and not just an abstract moment where the U.S., steamrolled over Mexico and then took away all this territory, which now we all feel, um, you know, is part of the United States, and, and that's great. So um, the main message of that war was as the main message of the book, I think, was that the war mattered to a lot of people in really profound ways. Um, the war mattered to all the officers that later fought in the Civil War. They got their start in the U.S.-Mexico War. I'm thinking of Ulysses S. Grant, who's the person who called it a wicked war, um, Robert E. Lee. Um, most of the generals in the Civil War fought in the U.S.-Mexico War. So it mattered to them, but it also mattered to all of the men who went to Mexico and fought, and it mattered to the family members of the people that went and fought. And it mattered to Abraham Lincoln, who gave his first national speech about uh, how the U.S.-Mexico War was immoral. So I wanted to place the war in the context of the time period and show how it affected the United States, but also how it affected people. The years of the war. Yeah, 1846 to 1848. Now let me go back to what you said earlier. Did James Polk lie us into that war? He did lie us into that war. <laughs> how many people died in the war, Americans? I think I want to say it was between 13 and 15,000 Americans. And what did America think of that war back then? It's a great question. So the war started off with a burst of enthusiasm. Uh, there was a whole generation of young men who had grown up hearing stories about the Texas Revolution, which was a decade earlier, about the Alamo, which of course we can never forget, um, and but also about Goliad. And these were these two uh, moments where the Mexican army uh, put to death prisoners in a way that was just horrifying to Americans and pretty much totally unethical from um, a battlefield standpoint. So people um, in the U.S. were raised thinking of Mexico as um, deceitful and, and a country that had really betrayed America. So when Polk said that American blood had been shed on American soil there was a huge rush of volunteer enthusiasm for the war. Um, many more men volunteered to fight than there was room for in the volunteer infantries. So the war started out with incredible enthusiasm. Um, and I think, interestingly, not just enthusiasm among the Democratic Party, which was James K. Polk's party, but also among the opposition party, the Whigs. So we live in such a partisan time now uh, that it's hard to imagine a president of one party declaring a war and lying to get the country into the war and politicians on the other side knowing it's a lie but still being very enthusiastic about that war and volunteering like a number of members of Congress just quit Congress 
to go fight in the war. And that was true of both the Democratic Party and the opposition party, the Whigs. So, but, but the thing about the war is that everyone was convinced that it would be a really short war. Like one battle and Mexico would roll over and we would be done, right? Mexico would give us everything we wanted. It was Texas, give us California. Um, it would be an easy fight. And in fact, James K. Polk, uh, his brother wrote him and said, uh, yeah, can I get a position as an officer in the war? I'm, I'm over in Europe now, but I'll come home. And Polk said, no, don't even bother. The war's going to be done in three months. It'll be done before you even get back. Little did he know that a year into the war, um, the U.S. would have won a number of battles securing both Texas and California, so basically getting America everything that we wanted, but the Mexicans refused to surrender. So that was the moment really when Americans started turning against the war, when reports of casualties started coming back, when um, a lot of soldiers died. Uh, but also when it didn't look like the war was going to end quickly. So I would say battle fatigue set in after about a year, um, and it was uh, a whole another six months after that, during which time the U.S. occupied Mexico City. So we occupied the neighboring country's capital. Mexico still wouldn't surrender. Uh, And that was when the public turned against the war. So by the time um, the Treaty of Guadalupe, Guadalupe Hidalgo, which brought the war to a close, by the time that that treaty finally made its way from Mexico back to Polk in the White House, February um, of 1848. By that point, um, there's a huge upsurge of anti-war sentiment. Congress has been taken over by the Whig Party, uh, and there are um, public meetings all around the country to bring the war to a close. So Polk is basically forced to accept a treaty which doesn't get him all the land that he wants because the public has turned against the war. If there was no Mexican war, what would be different about the United States right now? Well, that's a great question. So historians don't like to uh, engage in counterfactual exercises because who knows in general, but I have thought about this a lot. Um, so the first thing that you could say is, well, we wouldn't have California, right? I mean, I don't know if this is true. Mexico was in pretty bad financial trouble and some historians have said, well, Mexico would have eventually sold the United States, California. Um, Texas might be a different shape, might be much smaller. Maybe we wouldn't own New Mexico. Maybe we wouldn't have Arizona. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? What else would be different? Well, uh, James McPherson and his magisterial battle cry freedom makes a really good argument that the Civil War happened when it did because the North and the South could not agree over whether slavery should be allowed in the territories taken from Mexico. Had there been no Mexican War, maybe the Civil War wouldn't have happened when it did. Maybe it would have happened a lot later. Who was president? I I know that James Polk was only there for four years, 1845, 1849. Who was president on either side of him? Oh, okay. So on either side of him, the president that was right before him was a guy named John Tyler. And John Tyler became president when William Henry Harrison, Tippecanoe of Tippecanoe and Tyler II fame, when he died suddenly. And so um, John Tyler, who was this guy from Virginia and kind of on the ticket to balance the ticket um, with Harrison, Tyler became president and he was the first president who became president because the president had died. And when he first became president, um, everyone called him his accidency because it was an accident that he was president. And it's really to Tyler's credit that he was able to convince people that he was really president. Like now we take it for granted that if a president dies, the vice president's really the president. But at that time, no one knew. Maybe he's just sitting in until there could be another election. Um, maybe he should defer to Congress. No one really knew. But Tyler was able to um, grab the moment and say, no, I really am the president. You talk When you speak to me, refer to me as the president, and I'm going to act like the president. I'm going to do everything the president does. I'm going to veto as much legislation as I want. Um, and even though he was supposedly in the Whig Party, he vetoed a bunch of Whig legislation. He basically got kicked out of the Whig Party, which was the party that he was supposedly in. What about the president that came in after Okay, well, the president after James K. Polk was another Whig. It was Zachary Taylor. So we got Tyler on one side and Taylor on the other. 
Now, the problem with Zachary Taylor being president after Polk is that James K. Polk, who, when he first became president, he said he would only serve one term, um, and he stuck to that. It was really the last thing in the world that he wanted was to hand over power to the opposition party at the end of his term. And he did hand it over to a war hero in the war that he started. So ironically for Polk, because of his war, um, a general became president. And that general was Zachary Taylor, who was a Whig and opposed to Polk. The subject of this book is his wife, Sarah Childress Polk. What would you say about her? Well, there's a lot to say about her. I wrote a pretty long But I mean, I mean book. what would you just, if you were trying, some, you said some, <clears throat> she's going to be over at the house tonight for dinner and you wanted to tell your husband or whoever, your friends who's coming, what would you, say, what would you tell them about her? Okay, we're not going to serve any wine because she doesn't drink. Um, I would say that she is a charming dinner companion and the conversation is going to be wonderful. She's very well read. We can talk about the latest books. Um, she is going to be a very good listener, so she'll probably listen more than she speaks. Uh, and I think it's going to be a really fun dinner, but we're not going to serve her any wine. How educated is she? She, for the time, for being a woman, is extremely educated. She attended the Salem Academy, which is in North Carolina, and at the time was either the first or second best school for women in the entire United States. So this is a time period when colleges are not open to women at all. And if you wanted to be educated and your family had the means, your two options were either to have a private tutor or to go to a women's academy. And women's academies for a long time were poo-pooed by historians and scholars because um, they focused, part of the curriculum was on things like needlework and piano. Uh, So stuff that we tend to think now as not real learning. But in addition to learning needlework and piano, uh, the girls at the Salem Academy learned hard science, uh, political philosophy, mathematics. They were reading the same books that men were reading um, in men's colleges in the same time period. How many children did they have? So... Sarah and James Polk had no children. And the reason for that, everybody's pretty sure, is because when James was a teenager, he had um, crippling bladder stones. And there was no known treatment for this at the time, but his father heard about a doctor and took James um, over 100 miles to meet this doctor. And the doctor did surgery on James to remove the bladder stones. And it is pretty clear that this surgery left James um, unable to father children. So he and Sarah never had kids. One thing I would love to know, um, but they left no letters about this, is whether when Sarah agreed to marry James, she knew that they wouldn't have any children. Having looked at all of their correspondence and all the correspondents who knew them the best, Um, I've seen no evidence that they missed having children or that they wanted to have children um, or that they felt sad about not having children. But one thing is for sure is that the fact that Sarah Childress Polk had no children is what allowed her to flower into a political partner for James and really the most powerful political woman of the time period. Because everybody else, other women, James' own sister gave birth... Over 10 times, um, most women's lives was just taken up with childbearing and childrearing, and Sarah didn't have that time sink to worry about. The word piety you apply to her, why? She was extremely religious. Um, She was raised a Presbyterian, a kind of Presbyterian that was going out of style at the time that she was being raised, and that was almost a Calvinist Presbyterian. She believed like her mother, and like what were called old school Presbyterians, that God had basically determined um, whether or not you were going to heaven or hell ahead of time. And God was maybe unknowing, unknowable, and certainly that you could not 
ensure your own salvation, which is what a lot of religions in the time period, these evangelical faiths, uh, announced. And one reason why evangelical faiths became so popular is that basically they said to people, and I'm talking here about Baptists and Methodists and New School Presbyterians, they said, look, um, the God is knowable. If you um, look into your heart and you find the Lord, uh, the Lord will lead you to salvation. Sarah didn't believe that. So she believed in hierarchy and tradition and the catechism. And so it's a very, very traditional um, religious view of the world in which um, men were put on the top of the ladder, white men, and women were below them, and slaves were below white people, and this was all ordained by God. So it was right, in her opinion. She um, took the Sabbath extremely seriously. The only time I ever found her to deny James anything was one Sunday that he asked her to do some work for him, political work, and she just said she wouldn't do it. She didn't work on Sunday. Um, she didn't allow business to be done on Sunday. She didn't drink. She didn't dance. Um, she didn't play cards. Uh, this raised some eyebrows. Washington, D.C. at the time when she moved there was uh, kind of a freewheeling city. People drank a lot. Um, cards were extremely popular. Uh, everyone loved going to the theater. She didn't do any of this stuff. Uh, <clears throat> put this James Polk in perspective. I wrote down that he was in the House from 1825 to 1839, was Speaker, the only time that anybody has gone to the presidency from the Speakership, in 1835 to 1839. He was Governor of the State of Tennessee, 39 to 41. Why did he run twice and lose after he had been Governor? Okay, so that's a great question. So maybe the better question is, why did he leave Washington, D.C., where he had become Speaker of the House, uh, he had a great reputation. Um, his wife was extremely happy. She was this very successful political woman. Um, and by, they just both loved it there. So why did he leave? And the reason he left is because the opposition party, the Whigs, they were just taking the Southwest by storm. Uh, Kentucky was firmly in the hands of the Whigs, and Tennessee looked like it was going to fall into the hands of the Whigs, too. And the reason that everybody in these Western states liked the Whig program is that the Whigs were interested and willing to put serious money into improving roads and bridges and canals in the West. So everybody in the West, they want to be able to get their crops to market. They want to be more connected financially with the East Coast. They feel like um, farmers east of the Appalachians have an unfair advantage because there's no good roads and there's no good canals and there's no good um, shipping. So they're all falling for this, um, I guess you could call it big government wig platform, so Polk basically, he said, look, um, I'm going to make the sacrifice. I'm going to go back to Tennessee. I'm going to run for governor because I'm basically the only uh, Democrat in the entire state of Tennessee who is well-known and beloved enough to actually win as governor. So he wins. But the fact of the matter is, is that he um, doesn't have a successful two years. And ultimately, he can't stop the slide of the party into the hands of the Whigs. So when he runs uh, in 41 to get reelected, and he loses, that's the first time he's ever lost any race in his life. And it just comes as a huge shock. Um, I don't think Sarah, after that experience, expected him to run again or wanted him to run again. It made a lot more sense to just stay in um, Tennessee, uh, basically deal with business and wait for a call to come from Washington to go back to where they were successful. Either he could be um, a senator or uh, he could return to the House, but, but she didn't see the appeal of staying in Tennessee, but he wanted to give it another try. So he ran again, lost again. You say in your book that she helped him pass the gag rule. What was the gag rule, and how did she help? Oh, the gag rule. Um, so the gag rule, this is a, James's signature um, victory, I guess you could call it, as Speaker of the House. And the gag rule was a rule that tabled without discussion any petition that came to Congress that dealt with slavery. Now, the right to petition is enshrined in the Constitution. It's not something that anyone talks about now or cares about, but in the 19th century, it was a huge deal. So in a time before um, there are telephones, uh, when travel is difficult, Petitioning was one of the main ways that people could communicate with Congress. So a group of people, like-minded people, would get together and they'd write a petition. They'd send it to Congress. 
And starting in the early um, 1830s, uh, groups of anti-slavery Americans, particularly um, or notably women, would get together and they'd write a petition and they'd send it to Congress and the petition would say something like, um, we petition Congress that slavery be made illegal. Now, this is never going to happen. But the very fact that these petitions were being read out loud in Congress was so upsetting to Southerners that they were able to convince the American public and the House of Representatives that one of the main rights in the Constitution should be abridged so that they and their sentiments weren't offended. So slavery was seen as um, so sensitive uh, that you just couldn't talk about it. To suggest that slavery was wrong was so unacceptable that Southerners couldn't have it. So Polk, who of course was a Southerner and of course a slave owner, uh, managed to get this through Congress. And it was uh, shocking. It was a shocking thing, particularly for Northerners. And John Quincy Adams, who had been president um, years before, one-term president, he went to Congress as a representative from Massachusetts, and he made it his main work to bring up slavery as much as possible in response to the gag rule. So he would not be gagged. Uh, he was constantly being called to order within the House because he would get up and talk about slavery. How did she do the help work there? Okay. So James, not naturally good at convincing people to do things, uh, not a good communicator, not necessarily a persuasive person. Sarah opened up rooms in the boarding house that she lived in, particularly to entertain. And she held bi-weekly or tri-weekly dinner parties where she would invite members of Congress to come and talk, and they would talk over issues. And she would lobby them, carefully always saying, um, the Speaker of the House thinks this, or the Speaker of the House thinks that. Was he uh, there? Sometimes he was there. Oftentimes he wasn't. So he loved to work above all else. So many times he would just work and leave it to Sarah to do the negotiating. You say that you talk about how sick he was and that he died three months after he left the presidency at age 53. But one of the notes I wrote down is that at James's, James Polk's death, Sarah had 56 slaves. Yeah. How did that come about? And what about the Mississippi plantation? Oh, my gosh. So this book that I wrote, I mean, it's a biography of Sarah Polk, but it's, it's also about all the people that she owned. Um, and there were a lot of people. And it's about slavery, because slavery was central to the Polk presidency. Um, and it was really central to Sarah's life. Now, one of the reasons that Sarah was such an eligible uh, marriage prospect was that upon her father's death, she inherited eight or nine slaves. And those slaves were valuable human property. So men were lining up to meet her. She was wealthy, and a lot of her wealth was based in slaves. Both her family and James's family got rich off of slavery, growing cotton with slaves. So slavery is part of their whole family makeup. James um, started out as a lawyer, but he didn't make a lot of money. Um, he didn't, it doesn't really seem like he cared about money that much. He definitely wasn't a rich man. And he bought his first, mis his first plantation um, when he was in Congress, uh, and he bought it in Tennessee, and he just hoped to make money um, with it. So this required buying slaves to staff the plantation. He eventually sold that plantation, and he bought a whole bunch of land in Mississippi that the Choctaw Indians had recently been pushed off of. And this is really another big story of this book, is the way in which Indians are pushed off of land that they own so that slave owners can move in and use chattel slavery, um, African-American people, to grow cotton and make money. This is kind of how Western expansion happens in the Southwest. And Polk is not only driving that with his legislation and his presidency, but he's also making money off of that. So he buys a plantation in Mississippi, and he tells Sarah that he intends to make more money or lose more money. This is really the only time in his life that I see him 
um, really gambling. And he says, look, we need to really uh, make a gamble on this plantation and try and make some money. And he moves uh, the slaves from the Tennessee plantation there. And he also moves um, some of Sarah's family slaves there. Those are slaves that she inherited um, from her father, slaves that had been living with them in Tennessee. Um, and, but then he starts buying slaves um, because the mortality rate on this plantation and a lot of Mississippi Valley plantations is, is really terrible. The work is um, unrelenting. There's a lot of malaria. Disease climate is terrible. Um, young people move. African-American people are sold to Mississippi and they die. And this is one reason... For African-American slaves uh, who live on the East Coast, being sold to Mississippi is one of the worst fates that anyone can imagine because it's basically a death sentence. So he has to, James has to keep buying more young people to send to the plantation to work the cotton because they keep dying. While he's president, what, so this is kind of one of the things about this time period is that Southerners are insisting that slavery is fine, it's natural, it's even, um, you know, God's plan. Uh, Some Southerners are claiming slavery is less exploitative than um, working in a factory um, for an immigrant. They have a lot of crazy arguments like this. But um, that said, a man could not, in 1844, run for president and have it be known that he was buying and selling slaves, that he was involved in any way in the ugly, dirty business of slave sales. So Paul Cadet said, um, had his friends say, that although he did own slaves, he only um, owned them because he had inherited them or his wife had inherited them, and the only time he ever bought or sold the slave was to keep families together. This is what you had to say, to make it look like um, you cared about your slaves. No, this is just, uh, it's a lie. It's all a lie. And in fact, even as he was saying that, he was buying more slaves for this plantation. Now, once he was president, um, he couldn't be involved in any of these deals. So he had Sarah work as the middleman or middlewoman um, in between himself and the people he's buying the slaves from. So it was up to her to take the money um, to hand over for the slaves to be purchased and then sent to the Mississippi plantation. Now, All that said, I don't think Sarah was particularly involved in this plantation. Um, They had an overseer that was there. She didn't deal with the day-to-day business until James left her a widow uh, when he died in 1853. And uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. And so 1849, when he died in 1849. He was 53. He was 53. (laughs) And at that point, she inherited this plantation and all of its occupants. And this forced her to um, face the reality of owning a plantation, which is that as much as Southerners, especially Southern white women, might like to think that they were good to their slaves, uh, growing cotton on a plantation was a money-making venture. And ultimately, making money meant forcing the slaves to work, oftentimes beyond their capacity. So she was thrust into, for her, a difficult position. Of course, nowhere near as difficult as the position of all of the men and the women that she owned who were growing cotton, of running a plantation. And she did so up until the Civil War. And you say she was alive 42 years after he died. Yes, she was the the longest term anyone has been a widow. And what about, she got a franking privilege out of the government somehow to be able to send mail. How did that happen? So um, the franking privilege is kind of interesting. It was an honor that was given to her after James's death, uh, this right to send letters. um, And it was a right that was also given to former presidents and former first ladies at that point. Um, and, but she lost it again around the Civil War. They took it away from people. But she didn't make much use of it. She didn't write a lot. One of the interesting notes on the slave business is that she bought Paul Jennings from Dolly Madison. <laughs> yes. For what purpose? She bought Paul Jennings from Dolly Madison to help Dolly Madison out. Dolly Madison was destitute. Dolly had a son who... Um, 
gambled and basically gambled away all of her money. And she was basically broke. She's living in Washington, D.C. as this uh, dowager figure beloved by everybody, uh, but she was for all effects and purposes broke. So by buying Paul Jennings from Dolly, um, Sarah was able to give money to Dolly. But in point of fact, she actually only rented Paul Jennings from Dolly. So she employed Jennings and gave Dolly the money. So it's a way to help her out. Paul Jennings wrote a memoir. You can find it on Google. Have you ever read it? Yes, I have. It's amazing. He was a remarkable figure. Why? He was really smart. And he was uh, very... uh, He saw a lot of stuff. I think the autobiography is amazing and he was very dedicated to the Madisons who treated him extremely badly especially Dolly I think here's this uh, it's not a small item but it's not uh, earth shattering what role did she play uh, in raising money for the Washington Monument it's very funny that you say that as I was driving into DC today um, with my 12 year old daughter she said look look, there's the Washington Monument. And I said, did you know that James K. Polk laid the first stone of that monument? And do you know who raised the money? And she said, Sarah Polk. And I said, yes, that's right, because I've trained her well. Okay, so Dolly Madison had this dream for a monument to the father of the country, George Washington. And she convinced Sarah to help with the fundraising efforts and to reach out to all of her rich friends to build this monument to George Washington. And Sarah got on top of it, and together they raised the money for the monument, uh, enabling not the construction of the entire monument, but laying the cornerstone of the monument. And that's the origins of the Washington Monument. James uh, laid the first stone, I believe, on the 4th of July. You mentioned your daughter. Can I mention her name? Violet. Violet. Um, How old is Violet? She's 12. How many children do you have? I have two. What did Violet think of all this? You've spent how many years now working on Sarah Polk? Um, I I think she's very proud of her mother. Uh, she's a little befuddled, um, maybe. But yeah, she and her brother, who's a freshman now in college, um, yeah, they think it's they think it's good. But what, actually, the reason I ask that is that why should people care about this in today's world? What what, do, what can you you start out by saying that James Polk lied? Yeah, and we've heard that word a lot in the last several years. Uh, do politicians, have they always lied? No, I think James was the first one, the first president that I've seen that lied. Before um, the middle of the 19th century, uh, a man's honor was so important that politicians couldn't be known to lie. Actually, there's plenty of evidence that um, Alexander Hamilton lied, and I mean, politicians did lie, but you had to lie in a way that you had plausible deniability. Like, you couldn't lie in a way in which you could be caught out, because that would be dishonorable. This honor culture um, lasted about up to Polk. Now, the reason I wrote this book is that when I was researching the last book, A Wicked War, I was so astounded by all the stuff that Sarah Polk did and the way that she exercised power She wrote letters to a Supreme Court justice and members of Congress that were uh, completely confident 100% about politics and were not noticeably different from a letter that a man would write. And they wrote back to her in the same vein. No um, speaking down to her. Uh, Her brother as well. She had a brother named John. He would write her and he'd say, what's going on with? the species circular, or can you tell me what's happening with this election? I assume that no one knows as well as you do. So in her circle, it was obvious to me that she was treated, I can't say necessarily as an equal, but in a way that made no sense to me, given the way that we talk about women's roles in this time period. And it struck me that the narrative that we have of women gaining power when they gain the vote And, of course, we've got the anniversary of uh, women winning the right to vote coming up next year. That the narrative where political power stems from the franchise struck me as in no way representative of what I saw going on with Sarah Polk. And the more research I did on 
women that she knew, women in Washington, women who were married to politicians or children of politicians, but who lived in a political world. I saw more and more of this. Women who were not being treated as um, mentally inferior or unable to um, operate politically, that they were being treated as political actors. And in fact, they were political actors. They couldn't vote, but they were uh, influencing legislation. They were clearly expressing their opinions about things. And, And I thought Sarah Polk was the key to telling that story of an alternative political world in which just because women couldn't vote didn't mean that they didn't have political power. You, uh, on page 117, you referred to <coughs> James Polk's uh, inaugural address. So you sent me there, and I read it, and I have it in front of me. <laughs> I have it in front of me. The reason I want to read this, though, this is what he said back in 1845, 46, whenever he gave his speech. But I, I just want to ask you about this, because at the time, blacks weren't American citizens. Nope. Women couldn't vote. Could, I, did men have to have property back then? The, it, no, no. Thanks no. to Andrew Jackson, you did not have to have property to vote. Here's just one line from the speech. All citizens, whether native or adopted, are placed upon terms of precise equality. Yeah. All are entitled to equal rights and equal protection. He said that in his speech. Yep. Did everybody go, yes, that's... That was uh, That was the Democratic belief, yeah. I mean, the Democratic Party grew to power because Andrew Jackson came into office and he said, look, all white men should be equals. We're all equals here. No more hierarchy based on money or based on rank. We're doing away with rank. This is the United States. So white men are all equal. We're all equal to each other. And the way that he interpreted that was that no group should have any special privileges or special opportunities that poorer white men didn't have. So it wasn't saying um, everybody needs to have the same amount of money, um, but that everybody had the right to become as rich as they could. And, and nothing should stand in your way. If you were an uneducated farmer, nothing should keep you from having the same opportunities that the well-born son of a banker in Boston had. This was the big appeal of the Democratic line. And Andrew Jackson said it, and everyone who followed him and emulated him, and nobody loved and emulated Jackson more than young Hickory, James K. Polk, they said the same thing and they believed it. They believed it. And it's not a coincidence that blacks can't vote. This is part of it, right? Because if all white men are equal, that means everybody else is unequal, right? Got to go back to the speech. Um, This is another paragraph. It is a source of deep regret that in some sections of our country, misguided persons have occasionally indulged in schemes and agitations whose object is the destruction of domestic institutions existing in other sections, institutions which existed at the adoption of the Constitution and were recognized and protected by it. James K. Polk, his inauguration speech. Yeah. What do we think that institution is? Slavery. So here we have Mr. Gagrel speaking up and saying, North, stay out of the South's business. It's none of your business. We need no national banks or other extraneous institutions planted around the government to control or strengthen it in opposition to the will of its authors. Same thing that Andrew Jackson said. Exactly. I love the part about, he talked about national debt has become almost an institution of European monarchies. And he goes on, but I went back and looked up the budgets. But in 1845, it was 16 million. Yeah. Yeah. 46, it was 15.5 million, but in 47, 38 million, in 48, 47 million, and in 49, 63 million. Why did it jump? The, the war, the war with Mexico. You know, the U.S. had to, it's amazing that you, you brought up the debt line in there because nobody really cares about that line normally, but it's fantastic, right? Because what the U.S.-Mexico war does is it forces the U.S. to borrow all this money from European bankers. So we have to start paying off all of that debt. I've got to read that because give, just given today, we're at $22 trillion in debt. Yeah. A national debt has become almost an institution, as I said, of European monarchies. It is viewed in some of them as an uh, essential prop to existing governments. Melancholy is the condition of that people 
whose government can be sustained only by a system which periodically transfers large amounts from the labor of the many to the coffers of the few. What's the, what's the story around that back in those days? So the, the story here is that, like I said, the Whigs are really the party of big government, and they are willing to use debt in order to build infrastructure. And the Democrats are terrified of debt. They don't believe in debt. They don't believe in expending federal money for anything except the protection of the country. Anybody so, like that today? I don't know. I think there must be somebody like that today. But you can't name them off the top of your head. Well, I, you know, I only study the 19th century. I tell my, all my students if it happened after like 1899, I can't. I can't say off of the top of my head who it would be. Here's some more from that speech. Uh, it is confidently believed that our system may safely, may be safely extended to the utmost bounds of our territorial limits, and that as it shall be extended, the bonds of our union so far from being weakened will become stronger. Right. What's that? That didn't really work out, did it? What that is in response to is, again, the Whig Party um, were... They really didn't think that we should be spending all of our money and energy uh, taking territories way out to the West where nobody lived. What we should be doing is strengthening the economy where the people did live. So that meant build factories, um, uh, improve ports, uh, extend credit so that young men who didn't have any money uh, could take out some loans and start a business. So they really believed in economic development, whereas the Democrats just believed in territorial expansion. And the reason for that is that Democrats thought the most virtuous and best way to live in the United States was to be a farmer, to be an independent land-holding farmer. Don't live in a city, uh, grow your crop, um, participate in your community, and own your own land. And in order to do that, we needed to get more land. So it's two very, very different views of how the United States should develop. You write in your book about manifest destiny. What is it? Who invented the term? John L. O'Sullivan, who was a journalist, he coined the term. But the idea goes back almost to the founding of the United States, or perhaps even earlier. And this is the idea that the American experiment the movement of Europeans to this new continent, and especially Anglo-Europeans, that it was destined to be the greatest civilization in the history of the world, and that God had singled out this European people who moved to the Americas and who formed this amazing country, the first democracy with the first constitution um, and political freedom that This experiment, the United States would expand, maybe indefinitely, over all of the territory, anywhere near it, because of its superiority to all other governmental forms. And I think it was a deeply, deeply held belief. Even among Whigs, they didn't agree with the U.S.-Mexico war. They didn't think you should go to war in order to take territory. They thought it would be a natural process that anybody, Canadians, Mexicans, Anyone living near the United States would look at the United States and say, wow, everything is a lot better there. Let's join in. What was your key to getting new information? I mean, you mentioned earlier uh, about people that she wrote in the Supreme Court, John Catron, who was on the Supreme Court, and also Aaron Brown, who was a law law partner of James Polk. And you... You seem to have a lot of letters between that. Where where did you find them, and had they ever been published before? So um, before I wrote this book, there had been no scholarly biography ever of Sarah Polk. There was one short biography um, written by a doctor um, some time ago that had some very good information in it, but also... um, used some sources that professional historians don't um, accept as legitimate because they're fictional. And that was about it. 
And so putting together, trying to write Sarah Polk's story required building an archive of all of her correspondence. A lot of politicians and first ladies left ample amount of correspondence and left diaries. Uh, Sarah Polk didn't do any of that. So um, there have been a number of biographies recently that have come out about Louisa Adams, John Quincy Adams' wife. And I'm so envious of those scholars because Louisa Adams um, loved to write letters and she kept a diary and she kept up a remarkable correspondence with her father-in-law, John Adams. And there's all this material and Sarah Polk has very little material. So what I started out with is I collected all the letters I could find of, uh, find, and then I wrote to archivists. And I a lot of archivists helped me out. They put me in touch with um, people who owned letters uh, that hadn't been published. Uh, the editor of the Polk Papers, Michael David Cohen, uh, he was so remarkably helpful. He would, anytime they came across any letter that had anything to do with Sarah, he would forward it to me. Uh, so people, a lot of people all around the country helped me out with this project. I, I can't let you pass Michael yeah. Cohen without mentioning what you mentioned in your acknowledgments that he shared with you the only known example <laughs> of James Polk laughing. That's right. What was it? He found a, a letter where um, James was looking at the um, plans for this remarkable house he hoped to build um, in Nashville, which he did in a building. And uh, there was a joke about maybe one room would be um, the ballroom for dancing. And the reason that this was a joke was because, of course, James and Sarah didn't dance at all. But it was actually a joke that he was making. Like, it wasn't a particularly funny joke, but it was a joke. And, and yeah, he didn't, he didn't joke at all. How he long, had no sense of humor. Before we um, end this, I want to make sure I ask you how long you've been at Penn State. 24 years. What do you teach there? I teach American history, 19th century history. I teach a course on the early American Republic, which extends from the Constitution um, right up to the U.S.-Mexico War. It's one of my favorite classes. I teach grad seminars on 19th century history. I teach the U.S. and Latin America, because that's something I'm interested in. And I also have a class that I teach, which is called Sex and Violence in 19th Century America, which I designed to attract students to the class, because I figured... If it had sex and violence in it, they would want to take and, it. And did it work? Yes, it did. When, when do have you taught Sarah Polk to your students? Very little, not yet. And if you do, when do you think they'll get interested? And you, you kind of gave it away when you said sex and violence. But was there much <laughs> sex and violence other than the U.S. Mexican War back in her day? I mean, uh, well, I, of course there was plenty of sex and violence, but she had no part in that. <laughs> there were. Brothels. Uh, yeah, I mean, I talk about there's a lot of brothels in cities. Uh, Sarah, of course, did not go near those places. Um, there was a lot of violence. Bare knuckle boxing was an incredibly popular sport. Uh, Sarah, of course, did not go watch bare knuckle boxing. Was she a gossip? I don't I mean, think you say she in, was. You say in the book that he wasn't. I, he was definitely not a gossip. Yes, okay, if I'm going to be fair, I think she was a gossip. Because when you look at the letters that Aaron Brown writes her, they're clearly gossiping. And what was her relationship with Aaron Brown and uh, John Catron? I literally think they were friends, just straight up political friends who would rather talk to each other about politics than anybody else, because they both say that to her. She lived 42 years, as we talked about, after he died. How, how sick was he? So he never had a strong constitution. Um, I think... Uh, he just was never a particularly healthy person. He didn't really like eating. I don't think he ate very much. Uh, was he, he smaller than her? Well, smaller this is int- so people always talked about her as being tall, but when you look at her dresses, which are owned by the Polk Home, they are tiny. Like she was no more than a hundred pounds, and at the most five foot three. She had a size two foot. She was a tiny, tiny woman, but he was small. I think he was five six or five seven, and very skinny. So compared to him, she looked tall. Did she really wear black for the rest of her life after he died? She did. She did. She every never, day? Every day. But she was out among the public. She was out among the public. Um, her black clothes were well, uh, well, well trimmed, well turned out. They were well tailored. But yeah, she never stopped wearing black. She really embraced the role of Polk's widow. She saw it as her job in the last decades of her life 
to convince the American public that Polk had been a great president. Because by the time the Civil War is over, the reputation of the Mexican War is really not high in the United States. The Republican Party has taken over the government, and the Republican Party basically um, emerged out of the Whig Party. I mean, it really came out of a lot of different forces, but the Republicans really looked to the Whig Party as their forebearers, and they thought the Democratic Party was the bad party because it had been during the Civil War and certainly it was problematic before the war. So basically nobody had anything good to say about the U.S.-Mexico War or about Polk. So Sarah really made it her business to say, I am Mrs. James K. Polk. I am James's widow and I am going to talk whenever possible about what a great president he was and what a great war the U.S.-Mexico War was. And she made that her mission. Now, how many letters did you end up collecting? Um... Over 100, less than 200. And what are you going to do with those? Oh, they're all on my computer. Are you ever going to put them in a library where everybody can get to them that's eventually? A, that's a great idea. Yeah, I should do that. And did you get another book out of this time you spent with Sarah Polk? Is there something else you want to write about because of what you saw here? So I, I have been thinking about writing a book about the Polk Plantation in Mississippi because, like I said, I got really interested in the people that live there. And some of the people who were owned by the Polks and lived on that plantation um, ended up fighting in the Civil War on the Union side and then went on and had lives. And thanks to uh, pension records uh, after the Civil War, you can kind of trace what happened to some of these people. So I'm thinking maybe about writing more about the Polk Plantation. So last question, if uh, you got a chance to meet Sarah Polk, do you think you'd like her? Um, <laughs> I think I'd like her more than James. <laughs> but there would definitely be things we would not talk about, we couldn't talk about. Like? Like slavery, which she thought was right. And I'm actually not a huge fan of the Democratic political platform either. I think roads and bridges are great. The cover with her portrait is from where and and was it your idea? Oh, that's great. So the cover has um, a portrait that was written when she was in the White House, a portrait that was painted when she was in the White House, uh, which is a really nice portrait of her. And what the design people at Knopf did, this was not my idea at all, I don't tell the design people what to do because they have much better ideas than me, is they took one of James's campaign ribbons and the design on the campaign ribbon uh, and put it behind her. So as if she were running for president, I think it's very effective. And I was really impressed. The name of the book is Lady First, The World of First Lady Sarah Polk. And our guest has been Amy Greenberg. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. For free transcripts or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qa.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts. 